I want to thank um, Terry Maroney and the Huntington chapter of the uh, Long Island Press Coalition for inviting me to speak tonight. I want to thank Bob Franklin for moderating that wonderful introduction. So I kind of feel like I'm keeping you entertained for those pictures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I did want to thank Alice, who will be here shortly, for sharing his experience with us. Um, most of all, I want to thank all of you for taking part in the democratic process. As all of you know, Democracy is not just about voting once or twice a year. It's about a dialogue between ourselves and a dialogue between us and our elected officials. Um, to borrow a phrase, it's about creating a marketplace of ideas. Now, I know in that marketplace, some of you might expect me to take the role of critic tonight, because I'm known as Green Party activist, and I'm here to talk about what the major parties are doing. And I have to admit that knocking things down is a heck of a lot more fun than building them up. And it's a heck of a lot more easier. But if I walked out of here and all I did was tear things down, um, the activist in me would be feeling pretty empty. So I want to start with um, what I believe we and our representatives in D.C. can agree on. And as part of the expression that shared vision, I want to read the last two stanzas of uh, Michael Hughes' poem, Let America Be America Again. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear that so America will be. Out of the wrath and ruin of our gangs to death, the rape and rot of grass and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem. The land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plains. All, all the stretch of these great green states, and make America again. I think you said it so well, and I know all of us have an image of what America should look like to us, and we can make a list of things that need to be done to get to that America. Uh, I made a short list that includes some things. Uh, hopefully, unlike the recent State of the Union, I don't leave something major out like Katrina, uh, in your mind at least. Uh, I'm sure there are other issues, but here's some of them. Leave a rock. Now, institute universal single payer health care, abolish the death penalty, end global warming, repeal the Patriot Act, stop the torture, institute a right to have your vote counted. So the question becomes, why aren't any of these things on the hundred hour agenda of the Congress or on the immediate agenda of the Senate? Is it the military industrial complex? The need for corporate donation? Fear of going against corporately owned media? I feel like I'm here yet. I feel like I'm talking behind them. Uh, <laughs> as, as that media tries to convince us of what the popular opinion that we believe is? Or is it, as Senator Schumer describes in his brand new book, that going to policy meetings where goals are, in his words, turned into pavlum? He says, big ideas are made small, tough choices made weak, both plans were made timid. He concludes that a lot of the best stuff was drowned in the sea of consensus. Well, I'm sorry, Senator Schumer, that's not consensus. Consensus is where all parties meet, and they separate out their wants and their needs, and they try to meet the needs of everybody there. Or, Rolling Stone put it in a lot less stilted language, they said, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes, if you try, you might find you get what you need. That's consensus. What Senator Schumer describes is just the opposite. It's the worst kind of compromise, choosing the least common denominator or the lesser of two evils. The phrase always reminds, that phrase always reminds me of another musician whose painting was uh, actually used for the tie. Uh, Jerry Garcia said in a 1989 interview, constantly choosing the lesser of two evils is still choosing evil. To me, we need to overcome this, to come together to decide on what we want and work towards that goal, no matter who is in charge. That is obviously the belief of the move on of the world. Yes, in the emails I've gotten from them recently, they've toned down their rhetoric about how they describe Congress, but I'm still getting the same number of emails in my box, day after day, and they're telling me I have to write my congressman to tell them that I want to make America again. Now, obviously they don't know my congressman would be the king. Uh, <laughs> but they do know that even Democratic senators and congressmen can't be counted on for form as either. 
So what must we do? Well, to the end of that, I look to a speech from Frederick Douglass. And these are some of my favorite words. So I'd like to share them. I'm sure most people are familiar with them. Frederick Douglass wrote, let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet to be made to all best claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all absorbing, for the time being, putting all other tumults to silence. It must be do this or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the favor of freedom yet appreciate agitation are men who want cross without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. And they want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waves. This struggle may be a moral one or physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power conceives nothing without a demand. To me, that's the key phrase. Power conceives nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you will find out the exact measure of injustice and wrong, which will be opposed upon them. These will continue because they are resisted. Keeping Frederick Douglass to his words in mind, let's turn to the issue of the Iraq War. I turn to that as, as the issue that's most pressing, because that's given as the prime reason why the Democrats are given control of Congress. And this Saturday, many of us are going to yet again another mass demonstration to oppose the Iraq War that all of us asked them not to vote for in the first place. So let's see where we start from. Where do our Democratic congresspersons and senators start from on the Iraq War? Congressman Israel voted for the war in Iraq. Congressman Bishop voted for the war in Iraq. Congressman McCarthy voted for the war in Iraq. Senator Schumer voted for the war in Iraq. Senator Clinton voted for the war in Iraq. In fact, I'm sure many people here remember well Senator Clinton's words. That she didn't care that she got 10,000 emails opposing the war. She was voting for it anyway. Turning to Frederick Douglass's words, what is our demand? Leave Iraq now. No quibbling on the so-called troop surges like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, no timetables or excuses. Enough Americans have died. Enough Iraqis have died. Looking to ourselves as the example, when we threw off the mantle of English rule in this country, the French didn't say, oh, we have to stay and tell you how to run your own country. And we have to build huge bases here in order to make sure that you do it well. And while we're at it, we're going to take your natural resources to pay for these things. No. They left. And we had to govern ourselves. And what did that mean? We had the Articles of Confederation that failed within 10 years. Yes, failure happens. And then we drew up a constitution that affirmed one of the greatest evils known to man, slavery, was written in the words of our Constitution. And that caused an immensely bloody civil war in this country. Think about that history. Does it all sound familiar? Yes. It's what we visited upon Iraq by invading there and trying to run it. Let's talk about what ideas the Democrat majority put before Congress. There are several bills primarily focused on the distraction of the troop surge which is actually returning the troops back up to last year's level. I'm going to put those to the side, because that's not even close to what we want. There are also several bills that talk about a leaving around. All of them are disappointingly timetable bills. There is no bill put before Congress to get us out of Iraq immediately. The most popular timetable bill is the so-called Bring Home the Troops in Iraq Sovereignty Act, H.R. 508, which requires six months to get out of Iraq. That bill is being pushed by all the move-on type organizations, and it has the most co sponsors <laughs> bills I've seen, but don't get excited. In addition to its sponsor, Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey, there are paltry 16 other co-sponsors to this bill. The majority of them are the usual suspects in Congress who've been there forever. They're Barbara Lee, Maxine Waters, Diane Watson, James McGovern, Raul 